Hey everyone, how's it going? Thanks so much for tuning in. For today's video, we'll be taking an up close and personal in depth look with the Honda S2000. In this review, we'll start it up, show the engine, get an exhaust clip, and go over the performance data. We'll talk about all the changes over the years and show you many of the unique aspects throughout the interior as well as exterior. Aside from a cold air intake and aftermarket exhaust system, this is a pretty clean stock example of a 2002 S2000. A big thanks and shout out to Cosmo Motors of Hickory, North Carolina for allowing us this opportunity today. For more information about the dealership, including contact info and current inventory, please feel free to check out their website provided in the description box below. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop on in, start it up, let her run. This example is finished in Sebring Silver Metallic and comes paired to a black leather interior. There was a handful of exterior and interior color options for the S2000. Depending on your outside color choice, you could also have the option of red, tan, or even blue leather. Starting the S2000 is a two-step process. First, take the key and go ahead and turn the vehicle's power on. Then depress the clutch and hit the red engine start button on the left-hand side of the dash to go. The S2000 features electrically assisted rack and pinion steering with an overall ratio of 13.8 to 1. By now, many of you know the benefits of electric versus hydraulic steering such as the boost and efficiency that comes from eliminating parasitic losses. The other benefit especially here is making the setup more compact since you no longer have a need for the extra pump and hoses. This is just one of many things that played a key role in the car's overall design. Not just with styling, but drivetrain layout and even weight distribution. Similar to the system that first debuted on the NSX, a microprocessor senses vehicle speed and steering torque and is able to vary the amount of assistance. There's more boost at lower speeds, making low speed maneuvers even easier, while progressively lessening boost at higher speeds for a more direct feel. With a low center of gravity and its front midship layout, the S2000 corners effortlessly. It stays flat and well planted with tons of grip. The steering is very communicative and offers just the right amount of feedback. It takes 2.4 turns to lock and has a turning circle of 35.4 feet. The steering wheel itself is a sporty three-spoke design that's wrapped in leather with perforated portions across the sides, cruise control buttons in the bottom right and subtle grip bolsters at 10 and 2. The steering column is fixed with no adjustments which could potentially make finding an ideal driving position difficult for some, but for me it wasn't a problem. I'm 5 foot 10, with a bit of seating adjustments I was ready to go. Power is delivered to the rear wheels through a standard 6-speed manual transmission with a 4.1 to 1 final drive and a torsion limited slip differential. The latter sends power to the outside wheel, the one with the most traction, to help rotate the car through tight corners. No automatic transmission was available, which certainly isn't a bad thing as the manual is an absolute blast to drive. In fact, no S2000 ever came with an automatic. I've always thought Honda had an excellent 6-speed, especially in the Civic SIs I've driven. The short throw shifter feels great in your hand, the clutch pedal is perfectly weighted and has relatively short travel. It's also very smooth thanks to double cone synchronizers on 1st, 3rd and 4th gears and triple cone synchronizers on 2nd gear. Along with a low mass flywheel and a high performance clutch, the manual is quick to engage and respond. It pairs up well to the free revving nature of the engine and is geared to optimize high RPM driving. The strangest thing about driving the S2000 is trusting yourself to take advantage of all the revs this thing is able to churn out. Peak power isn't achieved till you pass 8000 RPM. As we'll discuss later on, when your mind tells you that it's time to shift, VTEC is just kicking in, then the real fun starts. So let's go ahead and flip on the projector, HID headlamps, as well as the hazards. The driver's side window is automatic down. 
So now let's go check out the exterior, shall we? Any sports car fanatic should drive an S2000 at some point, as it not only represents one of the most entertaining and influential sports cars of the last two decades, but it's the first Honda of its kind since the 1960s. After it was discontinued in 2009, following an impressive nine-year production run, nothing else has really stepped up to steal the S2000's thunder. Probably the closest thing I've driven to it is a 2014 Mazda MX-5. While a fantastic car in so many ways, the Honda takes it to a new level. Combining a lightweight chassis, a potent high-revving engine, an excellent manual transmission, and a wonderfully balanced chassis, the S2000 is a purest performer in every sense of the word. Everything about this car just seems perfect. The driving position is spot on, the styling is handsome, and it's more than capable as a daily driver. Despite a minimalist design, it came with just about everything you could ever want from a car like this at the time. S2000s came very well equipped from the get-go. One major option that was added starting in 2002 was a removable aluminum hardtop. Weighing just 44 pounds, the hardtop was a nice comfort feature for colder climates and added a touch of refinement to the car. It was later a standard feature on the Track Focus S2000 Club Racer. Digging through old press archives and reading through the many innovations and engineering challenges that took place in creating what you see here is so impressive. From the outside, the low-slung, wide-track two-seater certainly looks like a proper sports car, but the inner workings is what really made it a star and unlike anything else in its segment. Initially, the S2000 boasted 120 horsepower per liter, more than any other naturally aspirated production engine at the time. The styling was inspired by Honda's SSM concept car from 1995, featuring short overhangs, flared fenders, and sculpted lower side panels. HID headlamps were standard, as was a deck lid spoiler. While the general formula remained the same over the years, the biggest set of changes came in 2004, where a larger 2.2 liter engine was introduced, accompanied by revised gearing for the transmission, updated suspension tuning, and some styling tweaks. Considering the level of well-rounded performance the S2000 was able to deliver, all at an MSRP of around $30,000, it offered tremendous value, especially when stacked up against more premium competitors from Mercedes-Benz, Audi, Porsche, and BMW. Nowadays, depending on mileage and condition, you can pick up an early model S2000 for about a third of its original price, making it an even more enticing second-hand choice if you're looking for a fun drop top without breaking the bank. All of the body panels are made from steel except for the aluminum hood. It was designed from the get-go to be a roadster, but one that offered impressive handling and a stiff but lightweight platform. The level of rigidity this car has is very comparable to a fixed-roof car. That's no small task for convertibles, often requiring additional bracing, which can lead to an unfortunate increase in weight that could compromise a variety of performance factors. Luckily, this was not the case for the S2000, thanks to a new monocoque body and centralized backbone frame that was designed specifically for this application. The backbone is enclosed by the floor and runs down the center of the car in between the driver and passenger seat. The entire drivetrain resides behind the front suspension and deep in the chassis, leading to a near-perfect 50-50 weight distribution and a low center of gravity. Tying the frame members together with the side sills are diagonally braced bulkheads or X braces at the front and rear. This is the heart of the S2000's chassis. They create a strong beam-like structure that resists bending forces and displays high torsional rigidity. The front and rear subframes also tie into the braces. With the goal of keeping things lightweight and compact, the front subframe offers high lateral stiffness in the most efficient way possible. The rear subframe is a three-dimensional structure of hollow steel pipes that connects the rear portion of the frame members and floor tunnel to the upper and lower arms of the rear suspension. A large transverse cross member ties the rear beams together and provides an anchor point for the rear of the differential. Additional transverse cross members running underneath the seats provide even more stiffness in conjunction with reinforced side sills. Aside from the obvious handling benefits, this also creates an inherently strong structure that resists deformation in the event of an accident. Further facilitating energy absorption is high-strength tensile steel, which was used for the front and rear side members of the chassis. In the event of a rollover, the windshield surround is strengthened by a tubular brace, while fully trimmed roll hoops reside behind the seats, are internally reinforced as well, and securely anchored to the X-bone frame. The convertible top opens and closes in just six seconds. First, you need to unlock the two clasps on either side of the windshield header. Then press the little rocker switch in the center console to control the top. It tumbles into a dedicated storage compartment behind the roll bars. 
In between those is a small polycarbonate wind deflector that reduces cabin air turbulence when the top is down. When the S2000 first debuted, it had a plastic rear window, but that was all swapped out for a glass one in 2002, including a window defroster. The S2000 came standard with asymmetric aluminum alloy five spoke wheels, measuring 16 by 6.5 inches in front and 16 by 7.5 inches in the rear. They're wrapped in 205.55 and 225.50 high performance tires, respectively. With this setup, it's able to hold between 0.9 and 0.95 g of lateral acceleration. The brakes consist of 11.8 inch internally ventilated discs up front and 11.1 inch solid discs in the rear. All feature single piston calipers. The S2000 has been tested to stop from 60 miles an hour in a short 110 feet with excellent pedal feel. Four sensor, three channel ABS is standard. The S2000 also features a four-wheel double wishbone suspension with coil springs, monotube shock absorbers, and anti-roll bars front and rear. Compactness, a continued theme with this car, was part of the driving force for this setup. Honda calls it an in-wheel suspension, very similar to what you would see in an NSX. It allows for less unsprung weight and high rigidity while ensuring the hood could stay as low as possible. Unlike the NSX suspension, which primarily featured aluminum, the S2000 suspension is primarily steel. The wishbones are mounted to the body via specially developed rubber bushings to minimize the amount of road vibrations transferred to the interior. In the S2000's case, stiffness does not mean a choppy and uncomfortable ride. It's certainly firm, but it's surprisingly smooth. The impressive chassis rigidity allows the suspension to do its work unencumbered, pretty much eliminating any form of cowl shake and unpleasantness over rougher pavement. The S2000 is a proper sports car in every imaginable way that rewards the driver consistently. Overall length is 162.2 inches with a width of 68.9 inches and a height of 50.6 inches. It rides on a 94.5 inch wheelbase and has a curb weight of around 2,800 pounds with near 50-50 weight distribution. From 2000 to 2003, the S2000 was powered by a naturally aspirated 2 liter inline 4 cylinder, designed to be mass efficient and compact where needed and strong. It's an all aluminum engine with dual overhead cams, 4 valves per cylinder, Honda's VTEC dual variable valve timing system, and multi port fuel injection. The compression ratio is rated at 11.1 to 1, accompanied by a lofty red line of 9,000 RPM. Honda really went all out with clever engineering solutions when it came to designing this engine. Some of the more advanced components used include forged aluminum pistons, a first for a Honda production automobile, in addition to forged steel connecting rods, a forged steel crankshaft, hollow camshafts, and a cast aluminum oil pan. Bore and stroke measures 87 and 84 millimeters, respectively. Along with a number of friction reducing measures, including but not limited to roller bearing cam followers, special attention was paid to keep the engine as small as possible without sacrifice in performance. The press release is filled with innovations, too much to discuss in this video, but it just emphasizes how special of a car the S2000 was for its time. For example, to lessen the engine's overall length, much of the ancillary drive, such as the alternator, air conditioning compressor, and water pump, was relocated to the side of the engine rather than being in front. A new compact drive system used both sides of the serpentine belt. Honda claims this spared about 2 inches in front of the engine when compared to the 2.2 liter engine used in the Prelude making it about the same size as the smaller 1.6 liter engine used in the Civic at the time. The cylinders feature fiber reinforced metal liners. Composed of a matrix of aluminum, oxide, and carbon fibers, they weigh less, transfer heat quicker, and are more resistant to wear compared to conventional cast iron liners. The S2000's engine also uses a direct ignition system, which eliminates the need for a distributor and saves quite a bit of space so the engine can be placed behind the front axle for better weight balance. By placing the engine rearward, it freed up space up front for a low restriction intake system, designed to move large amounts of air into four specially tuned intake runners. It develops 240 horsepower at 8,300 rpm and 153 pound-feet of torque at 7,500 rpm. This propels the little roadster to 60 miles an hour in just a hair under 6 seconds and a top speed of 146 miles an hour. Like the 08 Civic Si I tested a while back, VTEC plays a key role in this engine's performance. It does this by using two distinct cam profiles, one optimizing the valves for low speed driving and fuel economy, while the other optimizing for high engine speeds and maximum torque delivery. 
When the profiles change over around 6000 RPM, the sound in the engine becomes even more aggressive and raspy, very distinctive. It all happens in the background, all you feel is smooth power delivery. If that's not enough, Honda developed a unique metal honeycomb catalyst that reduces back pressure by 40% over conventional ceramic units. While the S2000 doesn't have a ton of low end grunt, it coaxes you to drive at the limit if you want everything the car has to offer. It never gets old. The S2000 carries a 13.2 gallon fuel tank and requires the use of premium unleaded. EPA fuel economy estimates range between 20 miles to a gallon in the city and 26 miles to a gallon on the highway. The S2000 is one of the most driver focused interiors I've ever seen on a production car. Everything is quite literally at the driver's fingertips, keeping things simple and straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, S2000s are pretty minimalistic, at least on the surface. Looking through the interior is a perfect example. There's no glove box, no steering wheel adjustments, and even a faceplate cover for the radio if you want to keep things hidden from view. It's a car that was built for driving, not for frills, but it does have a number of unique and premium touches that emphasizes high build quality. It's the little things that really make the most difference, such as the door sill plaques that read S2000, manufactured by Honda Motor Company Limited. I love things like that, it makes the car feel more special. The majority of the touch points across the doors, dash, and portions of the center console are finished in padded material. There's perforated accents here and there, cool patterns across the doors, and even some aluminum detailing on the pedals and shift knob. Leather upholstery was standard. The seats are surprisingly comfortable and offer great lateral support and fixed headrests. Another surprising thing is how much room there actually is, both in the footwell and general passenger space. People around 6 feet tall should fit in this car just fine. Both of the seats are manually adjusting, both in recline as well as sliding back and forth, no height adjustment is offered. Being that the S2000 does not have a traditional glove box on the passenger side, a solution that allows for a lot more leg space, the interior storage space is a bit limited. There's little pockets across the door panels, there's a big one across the right side of the central tunnel, the main bit of storage is in between the driver and passenger seat, it's a little lockable compartment that opens up to a decent amount of space and also houses the button for your trunk release. Right beneath that is a 12 volt power outlet. The rest of the storage space can all be found in the trunk and we'll talk about that later in the video. In addition to the reinforced chassis that resists deformation in the event of an accident, other safety points include two front airbags, a reinforced windshield header, and roll bars behind the seats. Now let's go and see if she sounds, but sitting still and on the road.
go over all the interior features and highlight some of the unique bits. What I like most about this layout is how all of your primary controls are located at either side of the instrument cluster. It's so ergonomically friendly, very simple, and straightforward. This might be a far-reaching comparison, but it reminds me a lot of what Ferrari did with the 458 Italia when it first came out, locating everything around the driver. Genius, really. To the left side of the audio controls, while the right side houses climate controls. Buttons to activate the rear window defroster and cruise controller behind the wiper and turn signal stalks. Up top there's padded visors, a vanity mirror off to the right, a manually dimmed rear view mirror, and interior illumination. Behind the little faceplate in the center console you have an AM FM radio with CD player. The console is pretty sparse, you have your hazard switch, mechanical parking brake, and power roof controller, but you also have a single cup holder, a little storage tray, and that padded material towards the rear. The digital instrument cluster is another big highlight for the interior with that 9000 RPM redline, speed readout front and center and to the either side you have temperature and vehicle fuel. The low hood line and unobtrusive A pillars provides excellent front end visibility. The S2000 is a small car so you're not going to expect a ton of trunk space out back but you have around 5 cubic feet or so which might be enough to fit a small set of golf clubs but definitely a couple medium sized suitcases for an extended weekend vacation. In the very bottom you have a little storage net for extra security and tying down some items. You also have a space saving spare tire at the back and all of your jack and tire changing equipment is located underneath a little floor panel in the very bottom. Well everyone, I hope you enjoyed the in-depth look at the Honda S2000. Be sure to stay tuned next time, there's always a lot more where that came from. Take care everyone. When Nissan developed the first generation Skyline GTR in 1969, they...